What's going on everyone? So I'm super excited because we're gonna talk about, I think the biggest Star Wars Unlimited tournament that we've ever seen so far. There were over 200 players, 258, I believe. Yeah, 258 players to be exact in this European tournament. And we saw some pretty big upsets. In fact, the player that took it down, at least the deck that they were running, was a pretty big upset that we really haven't seen so much or too much in set two. We did see some of the classics, you know, the Bobas, the Sabines, and things like that, which we'll talk about, of course. We'll talk about all the top eight lists, but it was really nice to see something a little bit different in the top eight, and we're really going to be diving into that today. So let's not waste any more time. First off, though, I do have to make a couple announcements. One, big thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. Love the support. Thank you for uh, chatting with me and talking about all the videos and things like that. And also, I have a TCG player link in the description down below. Be sure to use it for any of your card needs. But guys, we got to talk about this tournament. So as I said, 258 players. And spoiler alert for those of you that don't want to, you know, wait too long. Boba or a Bosk Blue took down the entirety of the tournament, which was pretty insane. And as I said, we'll be going through all the top eight deck lists today. And we're going to kind of shorten the ones that we're used to. As you can see, of the top eight, we had Bosk Blue, we had a Han Blue, we had a Boba Fett Yellow, we had Palpatine Yellow, which another surprise. I don't think we've seen too much Palpatine Yellow. I believe there was one other Palpatine Yellow in a top eight over the past, you know, month and a half or so. We had a Cad Bane Red, so it came, it popped back up again, which was pretty crazy to see. We also have um, a Sabine Green, Boba Yellow, Boba Green, as the top eight. So really, really cool to see all those Boba's classic, Sabine classic, but the Palp Yellow, Cad Green, uh, Cad Red, and the Bosk Blue are all extremely exciting that we're gonna be diving in a little bit extra today. The question though, that we really gotta ask ourselves is, yes, we got a Cad Bane in the top eight. Yes, we've got ourselves a um, Bosk in the top eight, but how did they perform overall and how many people were playing these versions of the decks, right? You'll notice down here, these are all kind of the randos. We got like Mandalorian, Kylo Ren, um, we've got Boba Fett, the other version of Boba Fett, Luke, Grand Inquisitor, Krennic, all the ones that are kind of like a mm, little bit tier two-ish, but there are a few that people view as some of the strongest lists. That's Boba Fett, Sabine, New Han, Kira, Palp, Rey, Tarkin, Cad Bane, Bosk and Darth Vader are like the top list. You could add like Han Green in there, I suppose, or uh, uh, old Han in there as, as well. Um, but yeah, Boba Fett, Sabine, absolutely dominating in terms of popularity. And well, their win percentages also kind of match how dominant of a deck they truly are. If you just look at these top five most popular lists, Sabine and Green, uh, Sabine and Boba Fett have by far the highest win rates. Like it's not even particularly close either. Boba Fett with a total of a 54.3% win rate overall across all of their rounds, which is the highest out of all of the top five, our top five lists that we're going to talk about, our top five popularity um, of decks that we're going to talk about. There are a few other ones that have higher win rates. For example, Cad Bane and Bosk, uh, at least in terms of that have a reasonable sample size, do have higher win rates. However, remember, one of the, or both these, top aided and in Bosk's case took down the entirety of the tournament so it will inflate those win percentages just a little bit so the fact that Boba Fett does have such a high win percentage overall is quite insane same with Sabine a 53% win rate is extremely extremely strong Han Solo the new Han um we got 58% uh, win rate Kira with a 49% rate this is kind of interesting because this is now the second tournament with Kira that has dropped um, a sub 50% win rate. I believe the last one that we talk about, uh, talked about Kira had what, like a 48% win rate overall. So that might be kind of a consideration that the meta isn't friendly to soft control lists or to Kira specifically, which is what I've been saying since the beginning of set two. However, I do think Kira is the strongest variant of the soft control list. So if you are looking to play, you know, a little bit more controlling than Kira, at least from what I've seen performs the best. However, we do have Bosk coming up today, which is a hard control list, which is kind of interesting. Palpatine, really solid win rate as well with a 52% overall win rate, uh, which again, 
very solid in terms of comparing it to the competition really only falling behind sabine and boba and as we go a little bit further down uh you'll notice that like tarkin absolutely dumpstered here and 38 percent win rate this might just be a uh, cause of variance because there's less sample here but cad bane and boss both performing quite nicely if you were to omit the outliers here with cad bane and bosk you would definitely have a sub 50 percent win rate with cad bane not quite with bosk however um and we just pop back over the standings we had a 12 and 2 finish let's just say this is a more average like a uh well 14 games total so seven and seven granted the whole tournament was only 11 rounds if you weren't top eighting because you played more games so let's say instead of that you ran like a six and five finish well let's say six and five we just remove a total of well 12 wins from this right 12 wins you add six on top of that you're going to find that it's actually pretty close to 50% win rate with Bosk. So that's going to be something to consider as well. These are definitely outliers because people, singular people, performed exceptionally well on them, which might just be something like a fluke, but we'll talk about that more in a little bit. In terms of the top three, because this is something that I was really curious about. Some of these are, are pretty standard, like Kira's mostly Kira green, Tarkin's mostly Tarkin yellow, and that type of stuff. Boba Fett, Sabine, and Han. These, well, if you look here in terms of cards played, we will see that, well, for one, a lot of people are using all the wrong bases, guys. You got to keep, keep consistent with the bases <laughs> so that we can analyze it a little bit easier. We can see Jabba's Palace, Administrator's Tower, Chopper Base, all yellow, and that at least in terms of just those three, you're gonna end up with over 50% in Boba Yellow. You have a little bit in Boba Blue and Bo uh, Boba Red with Kestra City, Capital City, both those are Boba Red, Boba Blue. In terms of Boba Green, which is the other kind of pairing with Boba Yellow that's actually taken a lot of top spots. At this point, we have Energy Conversion Lab, which is 7% seven, uh, 7 there. Command Center, another 4% on top of that. That's gonna be 11%. We also have um, echo base which is another two percent so really not all that much so in total that's going to be another 13 percent that's going to be boba green uh oh navarro city as well um is actually wait navarro city is oh is green yes navarro city is green that's going to be um, another four percent on top of that so a total of like 17 percent boba green definitely secondary to boba yellow but still a decent chunk playing that so definitely majority boba yellow and that's where the majority of the wins were actual um actually reflected in the stats here if we go back over to the meta game and we pop up sabine ren we can look at the cards that they're playing and it's very much focused in on come on pull up the cards what are you doing sabine oh come on come on I wonder why it's not pulling up those cards. Um, anyways, it was mostly Sabine Green as far as I checked out earlier. It was a vast majority Sabine Green being played, which is pretty important to realize. And then the new Han here, we've got vast majority playing Han Blue, right? Only a tiny percentage were playing Green uh, or Double Red. 11%, as you can see, were playing Energy Conversion Lab. Everyone else here was playing han blue so the new han blue and i do think that that is the by far more dominant deck of the variants for han solo although i do think han green is extremely strong i do think han blue in general just has on average a better matchup against the meta game right now but han blue new han blue sabine green and boba yellow are going to be the major contenders of the popularity of these decks it's mostly those variants and not necessarily split amongst a lot of different variants. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at these stats. It's not that Boba Fett leader is dominating everything and Boba Red and Boba Blue can just take down tournaments without actually doing anything. It's Boba Yellow that's taking down tournaments. It's Boba Green a little bit and Sabine Green that are really taking down tournaments alongside New Han Blue. But that's enough said about the meta game and kind of what we're seeing in terms of overall meta. What I really am curious about is starting to dive into some of these deck lists. And as I mentioned, we're going to be going through all th eight of them. This is the first one that we got to talk about. And this is the deck that took down the entirety of the tournament. And that is Bosk Blue. And if you just look here uh, in terms of what the amount of units that we're playing, we are really playing a hard control list. We have very few units. We have three Pershings, 
three clients, three Chilsons, one Palpatine, three Avengers, and two Crate Dragons. And that is it. Those are all the units that we're playing. I believe this totals up to 15, right? Three, six, nine, 12, 15. 15 units in the deck. Everything else is either some sort of way to draw cards, some sort of way to heal, or some sort of way to remove opponent's units. And we have a lot of it, right? If you just look, three power of the dark sides, three make it openings to deal with, you know, tie phantoms, three open fires, kill things early, three pillages to attack opponent's hand, three vigilance, three takedown, two fellow dragon, one rival's fall, three super laser blast, etc., etc., etc. If I were to look at this list, I would immediately think like Vader Blue from set one. The Bosk unique thing would be top target death mark and the client in terms of where you're trying to get value the client is really nice with boss because you can flip boss early and really gain a ton of hp death mark can help you kind of draw some extra cards if you can double claim but to be honest the real strength of boss lies in the fact that you can consistently get that one damage out when you're putting bounties on things or if your opponent just has natural bounties but top target able to heal you an early flipped leader with boss helps you kind of stabilize the board but what i'm most excited about is we are seeing a true hard control list actually be able to perform in the long form of a tournament which is not something that's necessarily happened as of late yes we've seen kira greens yes we've seen um krennic greens we've seen other various soft control forms i think you've even seen a palpatine blue hondo blue come up in top eights Bosk Blue might just be in the same tier as those where, yes, they can take down tournaments. They're really like a tier two deck. But the things that make this strong, realistically, is just the fact that you can attack on so many angles with Bosk. You're able to constantly remove units from your opponent's side of the battlefield. And I've played a lot with Open Fire. I think it's actually a really underrated card. Pillage attacks their hands. So if you don't have a way to deal with you know opponent's units or you don't have the ability to deal with opponent's units because they're not playing any units you could still attack your opponent's hand you have ways to heal up and this is really important against sabine green and boba yellow with top target the client and vigilance if you don't have a way to heal you are basically going to lose every single game you have a way to deal with tie phantom in make an opening entrenched for example these are really excellent against those and you have a way to repeatedly deal small chunks of damage to whatever target you are dealing with and this is really helpful in the early game, right? Boss coming down or a boss coming down with his action after you've top targeted or death marked someone in the early game, you will eventually be able to remove that unit, right? Turn one, they play a unit. Turn one, you play a death mark, right? After like two or three turns, you've killed that unit kind of for free. And it's not even really two or three turns. Um, it's, well, I guess you could say two or three turns in actual game time because you have to count that first turn because boss can use his action on first turn to deal one damage to something, which is really quite nice. But also you have the same kind of things that you're used to in Vader Blue, as I talked about previously, which is like just playing a 6-6 six, six Childs and Sentinel is a massive brick wall for Sabine Green players. Yes, they can Dark Saber. Yes, they can kill Childson and survive, but that puts them in range of Force Chokes, making Openings, um, Vigilances, Takedowns, and all the other things that kill a Sabine leader, which is really, really rough. Big Sentinels, just good. And then because you're playing Aggression and because you're able to heal up a lot, one of the big an amazing ender that you didn't have previously in set one is crate dragon crate dragon can really help you kind of maintain control of the board despite your opponent playing more and more things this is a really sweet list in terms of sideboard you're kind of just adding on to the things that you already have another copy of top target we have fella dragon we have rivals fall more copies of those dealing with big big units force surrender is a little bit interesting uh it um is a way to really mess up your opponent's hand and give you more options later on in the game if you're able to attack their base. Another crate dragon, again, for those matchups that do go long and you're able to leverage crate dragons, but also two copies of Punishing One and three copies of Spark of Rebellion. This is something that we saw again in set one with hard control lists. They were playing Spark Rebellions and Restocks. As you can see in the main deck, we also have one copy of Restock. And that is because of the soft control matchup slash hard control matchup. I'm Curious to note how many times Restock and Spark Rebellion actually came into play. Spark Rebellion, I guess, can be used in some matchups where you're expecting like U-Wing reinforcement or like big single cards that you can take out of their hand. But usually Spark Rebellion was sided in alongside Restock or 
with restock in the main deck because of you trying to get rid of your opponent's restocks and your opponent's vigilances so you can mill your opponent out this is something that is a little bit more niche in set two because you're not really running up against hard control or even like more controlling versions of soft control all that often but it can be relevant and punishing one's a little bit interesting as well because it's a way you can kind of get immediate value out of your space unit if your opponent's playing you know some early space units like a wings or wing leaders or whatever or maybe a wing into wing leader you might be able to death mark something earlier on right like let's say you go death mark on turn one along the side there a wing it's a three four now because you've pinged it with boss they go wing leader uh, and pump up their a wing and you play or you ping it again with boss suddenly it's a three three right in terms of stats well you play punishing one and later on if they don't immediately kill punishing one you can potentially kill a wing and then ready up something again or what you could do is do something like play punishing one play a rival's fall or a top target on like a wing leader and ready it up again that's something that's really really strong if your opponent's dealing with a lot of space units and i think punishing one is really there to deal with a lot of those space units because there are decks that are really focused in on space think like yellow tarkin which we did actually see as one of the top uh popular decks one card that i am excited to see because i do think it's a fun card but i don't find it to be all that great at least it doesn't perform on average that well for me is dr pershing Dr. Pershing really does want a lot of time and a lot of ways to deal with opponent's units. And fortunately, Dr. Pershing with Bosk is a nice pairing. One thing with Vader is that sometimes the Vader flip can take too long as, again, this is kind of the same shell. But with Bosk, you come down so early with a 4-6 that kind of can help you control the board that drawing some additional cards can really pay off in the later stages of the game alongside things like Death Mark. So overall, Pretty sweet list, and I'm excited to see it take a top eight spot. In fact, the whole dang tournament. Next up, we got Han Blue, and I know a lot of people have been, um, you know, playing this list lately, and this is the deck that I find to be overall kind of the best positioned in the meta, even though it struggles a little bit against some of the more ramp value decks. Uh, like Double Green Palpatine can do a number on this. It does do well against Sabine Green, usually if you are kind of preparing for that. Things like Village Protectors, Concord Donors, Risk can really help you. But usually this deck is just trying to play expensive stuff on curve and outvalue your opponent. And guess what? This deck is no different. Playing your Sabine Runs, your A-Wings on turn one, just naturally, or maybe a Cassian on turn one. Getting your Yodas down, your Kanans, preparing for Force Throws. Uh, you might be getting down your units and then Carabasting things away. This is basically the exact same list that I was personally running um, when I was playing Han Blue. A couple of modifications that I made, at least in my list, um, entrenched. I had an additional Chewbacca. I was not playing any takedowns, actually. Uh, I was playing, or actually, I was playing one takedown and then I swapped to zero, depending on kind of what I was fighting. I had the full three of Obi-Wans. I went down to two K2s and I was actually playing one copy of Rey. Each of these modifications don't mean that much but it does change what you're going to be a little bit stronger at uh, i prefer to play more fell the dragons uh, even in my main deck slash sideboard i had the full three of between the two because fell, Dra fell the dragon is just an amazing removal against some of the decks that you're a little bit struggling against so overall i mean you're gonna find that this deck outvows your opponent very quickly gets down early with some more expensive units and sometimes you can just outpace your opponent immensely and just completely envelop them and that's what this deck's trying to do in terms of sideboard well guess what you have more copies to finish the play sets of a lot of different cards in the main deck uh two cards that are not in the main deck that are in the sideboard here are mystic reflection and disabling fang fighter so mystic reflection acts as a kind of like a make an opening if you have a force unit which can be a little bit tricky sometimes so i'm not a huge fan of this card uh, and Disabling Fangfire can help you deal with like Darksaber Sabines and whatever other upgrades your opponents are playing while also providing you another body that can actually deal with a couple of other space units that your opponent might be playing alongside that upgrade. Next up though, we have Boba Yellow and yet again, another classic list. Th these lists like Han Blue and Boba Yellow aren't really that interesting to talk about because they are literally just the same list that we've been seeing over and over and over again. And it's just a matter of, oh, I'm playing one less a new adventure and i'm playing the full three of bodhi or i'm playing two of bodhi or i'm playing two of zuckus and three of four like that's the type of modifications that we're making and guess what this list is once again no different 
Uh, they have the Toro Calican plus Bounty Hunter package, which is something that we do kind of need to mention because that is some difference that happens in a lot of these games. You know what's funny is this is a tournament where if they had Lurking Tie Phantom main deck, they might have been in a situation where they would have been better positioned because there was a couple of soft control lists. And in, in the finals, there was a hard control list. Now, if we go back over here um, to um, the Han Blue list and we look at the standings, you'll notice that, well, Han Blue actually got second place. Um, but if we look back, there might have been a game between the Boba Yellow player and a the, the Boss Blue that took it down. Not saying that this is exactly the deck that went up against it, because I don't actually know the exact matchups of the top eight, but Lurking Tie Phantom could have been something that you might want to have considered in the main deck. And at least when I play Boba Yellow, the deck that I usually take does have one to two copies of Lurking Tie Phantom in the main deck, because it's such a catch-all against all the soft control, hard control decks. It just does a complete number on them. Everything else is pretty standard, as I mentioned. Um, Hotshot Blasters, Cunnings, Three Waylays, Two no good to be dead, one shoot first, three surprise strike. All this is pretty standard. Sideboard's pretty standard. I actually like the Relentless Pursuit main deck as well, especially if you're running the Bounty Hunter package. It can just be excellent. Bodhi Rooks in the sideboard for any like controlling matchup or something that's relying more on events. Standard, standard stuff. Next up, however, we've got a little bit of an exciting one in Palp Green, or a Palp Yellow, rather. Palp Yellow is definitely something that is a little bit more odd it's a little bit strange to be running palp yellow and this list is all over the place i'm gonna be honest i've seen a lot of palp yellow lists and it's usually relying on like v wings and sneak attacks and change of hearts and things like that to kind of get some value and while this does have some aspects of that they're playing a ton of one of and two of cards which might just be kind of their toolbox and that's what they're relying on but I'd be curious to know if this player would go back in with Palp Yellow and have as consistent as res of results as they did today because of all the one ofs. This is something that doesn't really concern me most of the time, but in this deck, I mean, there are just so many one ofs. If you look, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different cards in the main deck that are one ofs. And in some cases, they kind of fulfill the same spots, right? If you look at like General Veers in Black Sun Starfighter, they're acting as those three resource plays. Waylay kind of acts as another removal or, or tempo play alongside No Good to Me Dead. We have a command that acts as like kind of another ramp portion. One card that's a little bit exciting is Shoot First. That's a card that we don't really see too often. They're playing a ton of events because they're playing ISB Agent as one of their... Um, early plays alongside like tie fighter and greedo it looks like they're trying to get down on the board earlier with a lot of one drops and kind of ride that through the entirety of the game yes they have the ular and royal guard combo but they don't have actually have a lot of officials so getting that turn to sentinel three five is really not all that frequent and in some cases they can just beat down right with general veers off of isb agent tie fighter turn one into general veers that's a lot of power and toughness on the board and can kind of just overwhelm your opponent this is a very, very interesting list, but not one that I'm very convinced by. Again, it seems just a little bit too inconsistent for my liking. If we pull up the sideboard, what you'll notice is, once again, there's like a ton of one ofs, like a one of power of the dark side, one of command. Uh, I Well, command and change of heart expands on the main board alongside Relentless and Devastator. One of Bazine, two of Viper Probe Droid, and as I said, the one of power of the dark side, also two of Strike True. A lot of these cards make sense, and I know why they're in the deck. Like Viper Probe Joy can really act well as a nice, you know, unit that trades off early with opponents' units. Strike True really ends up being one of the better removal spells or removal events in Palpatine because you have such big units that can just kind of guarantee your big damage to an opponent's units. The change of heart to make sense, Devastator Relentless for some of those bigger matchups, things that are relying on events, etc. All pretty standard stuff. I'm not sure why, like, the one of Power of the Dark Side, the one of additional command into the two of command main deck. Like, I'm not sure where the player is coming from. Not to say this is wrong by any means. I'm just saying I personally am not necessarily convinced, but they may have tested. This might just be a deck where they're like, I'm going to throw all the cards that I have to try to make a deck together. And we're going to see where it goes, right? Like, oh, I don't have the three of change of heart. So I'm going to, or a uh, three of traitorous. So I'm going to play this and this and whatever. It doesn't seem like that because they're playing some very expensive cards, right? Like three Darth Vader's, two Devastators, two change of hearts, 
two command or three change of hearts across the main and sideboard same with the three devastators two of commands right these are not cheap cards so if they were doing that i would have expected some other options but i'm curious to see if 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 you're the person that made this deck this will be a very fun interview i would love to hear your thoughts and kind of how you came to this conclusion because it's very interesting to me but we also have another one that's really fun to talk about today and that is cad bane red now cad bane red has been a pretty hot one lately and this is i believe the list that Wu has um, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same. Um, I believe he's not running Guavian Antagonizer, if I remember correctly, uh, or the, um, no, he's uh, it, it, running the, the Punishing Ones and, and, and the Ruthless Raiders, I'm pretty sure. But everything else, pretty standard stuff. Uh, this is a pretty fun list in which you're just kind of leveraging a good curve and the ability to deal one to something every single turn, doing a little bit of controlling with the daring raids to finish off targets with cat bane ma clunky alongside that and tarkin town can be really really oppressive right you're just kind of playing a tempo deck right that's what cunning's trying to do but because of cat bane's pings your tempo is really really powerful alongside tarkin town because you can actually remove units just as like things like boba fett do while also deploying pressure to the board which can be really really strong if we look at the sideboard, this is where things change a lot for this deck compared to what I'm used to. Uh, crate Dragons are absolutely brand new. We have Confiscate in the sideboard, which I think is a really nice choice alongside Change of Heart, which I think is a really nice choice. This is a very tempo-oriented deck. You're just trying to play things on curve, and a lot of these things do something when they come down, right? Ambush with Cloud Rider, get something valuable. Uh, Crafty Smuggler is an Underworld card, usually gonna be able to trade up into a 3-3. You have things like Forlom and Zuckus, which can pump up and just or, uh, punch up and get some value there. Bosk kind of becoming a 5-5 ambusher, not always. Heck, even the things like Hotshot Blasters make sense in terms of smuggling these out and getting them on the units and getting in for a lot of damage. You have 8 Toughness on a leader, which is pretty impactful as well, even though it only attacks for 4. All of these things make sense, and all of these things are actually pretty oppressive. Depending on the deck you're going against, Cad Bane's action can be one of the most annoying things to deal with. If you're playing like something that relies on some shield tokens early on, dealing that one damage to get rid of the shield token is huge. If your opponent's playing like Han, so like New Han, dealing a couple points of damage here and there can be really, really bad for you, right? All these things are things that we need to consider when you're playing Cad Bane Red. And again, that tarkin town daring raid really helps you control the board as you're going along the curve so it's something that you really have to consider and it makes cad bane red really really quite powerful sabine green another pretty standard one uh after this is kind of some more standard options but sabine green not too much to talk about here we're seeing basically a stock standard list the one exception to a stock standard list here that we have is going to be the one copy of confiscate and I guess I should also mention this list in particular is running a lot of non-units. We're running the three of Rebel Assault main deck, two of Heroic Sacrifice, two of Heroic Resolve, two of Darksaber, and two of Timely Intervention. I've played this many events here. I'm not a fan, especially since um, you have, in this, at least in this deck, 11 turn one plays, which is a little bit on the lower side. I usually prefer 12 to 13. We have a decent amount of three, three resource plays, and then you have K2, Podammer, and Wrecker. But that's not really what i'm worried about it's usually the, the games that you draw all your events and not enough units and you can't actually make a curve out because of all the events you have in your deck the main deck confiscate perhaps that's just a meta choice they expect things like entrenched they expect things like traitorous or, or whatever it is a confiscate main deck just cheap doesn't need to be a three resource play in like disabling thing fighter for example but it is a little bit tricky to get off because or get this many events off in a sabine green deck because you are really limiting kind of your consistency in terms of being able to play units every single turn yes you're not going to have the full eight of a wings like eight copies of it in a deck so you're not always going to play a wing but playing like an x wing or an a wing on turn one kind of does something very similar same thing goes with you know changing up the rest of your curve or you know adding some one resource plays or adding like spec force soldier in against the sentinels in the sideboard there's a couple of little bit of spice in the sideboard we have well maybe not necessarily super spicy the two of daring raid which can be really nice in certain matchups yeah dealing the last points of damage against han blue this can be kind of relevant as a tempo play 
Admiral Akbar, very similar, deploying to the board, getting something down, killing something, disabling Fangfighter, presumably for the same matchups that Confiscate is coming in, or uh, rather, Confiscate is in the main deck for. The card that is a little bit, I guess you say, uh, out of place is the Chaos of War. Not necessarily out of place, but something that I haven't really seen yet in Sabine Green. It does give you a little bit of extra reach. It is five resource to be able to play it. But in some matchups, like let's say against um, Ray Blue oftentimes, or, or Ray Red rather, or Palpatine decks, or even like the Bosk Blue deck, you are probably going to be fighting an opponent that has a ton of cards in hand. This can hit for like six, seven points of damage and can really wrap up a game. So I actually do like the adaptation here in the sideboard especially for at least this meta that we saw. We also have a Boba Yellow to talk about again. Um, <laughs> this one, very straightforward once again. Similar Bounty Hunter package to Toro Calican. I like the two of Lurking Tie Phantoms main deck. And the other thing I like is the two of Relentless Pursuit main deck. This is a really powerful card. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of a new adventure. I do like it relegated to the sideboard. So seeing my uh, our, our friend here going ahead and doing the double Relentless Pursuit main deck and two new adventures sideboard is kind of where I would situate myself. If I were to compare the first bubble yellow list to this bubble yellow list, this is much more what I would bring to a tournament. Although I would probably go down one Viper Probe Droid or maybe even both of them and go the full three of Crafty Smuggler and the full three of Toro Calican um, as kind of my options. Or maybe even just bringing the last No Good To Me Dead in the main deck. There's a lot of different reasons for it, but Crafty Smuggler having something that doesn't die early on into the game and you can put on pressure with, even if it's only two damage, is extremely relevant. Having Lurking Tie Fandoms is a really, really nice meta choice at least from what we're seeing here in this tournament, especially since a hard control list took down the entirety of the tournament. Lurking Typhandom would have been excellent in that matchup. It's one of the reasons why people are playing make an opening of the full three over the main deck because Lurking Typhandom is such an oppressive card. Relentless Pursuit can be really good in certain matchups, especially against like Sabine or especially against um, other matchups that are kind of going toe to toe, putting out pressure the early game, getting something uh, captured and then putting a shield token on something can be really, really oppressive. But again, not too much to talk about here because it's the same stock senior Boba Yellow list that we've been seeing. Lastly, however, we got to talk about this Boba Green list. Now, I'm not sure if this is 100% the exact same list as the previous one. Um, I'm sure if I were to pull up my previous video, I could find it. But what I will say is yet another Boba Green list that is not bringing ECL and still taking a top eight spot. So there might be something to this. I, again, have played a lot of Bubble Green, and I am not something that, uh, or I'm not someone that really thinks the Boba non-ECL is going to be, like, the absolute best. But that remains to be seen. We've still seen a couple of top eights with Boba ECL earlier on, and nowadays we're seeing no ECL, Boba Green in the top eight so perhaps i am just antiquated and i need to get with the times and play more of this non-ecl version and compare the two directly but if we pull up the list and i decided to do so just because i was curious while i was talking here the lists seem pretty similar we go along the curve earlier on in the in the uh deck or earlier on in the curve very similar in terms of numbers they're playing dr evazon um this or last weekend whereas cloud rider was the choice alongside cartel space here for our uh, our friend up in top v-wing was the choice down here there's also playing kind of um this cob vanth which this person ended up not playing i kind of agree with the person on top uh because cob vanth just seems a little bit odd i've not been impressed with the card it seems like they were not either because they decided to relegate it to um, not in their deck. <laughs> they still have the three of Super Laser Technician, the Seven Fleet Defender, and, well, Boba Fett. Um, although they have the three of and they have the two of down here, or the old version had the two of. Still have the three of Fest Fire Spray, Darth Vader, Mauls, two of Reinforcement Walker. I will say one of the big difference in this bottom list is the one of Jetpack and the full three of Boba Fett's armor. These cards are not actually in um, or at least the full three of both its armor and the one of jetpack is not in this Boba Green list. So I actually prefer this Boba Green non-ECL list over the previous one, at least in terms of my personal experience. I like both its armor, but it's a card that can be really hit or miss in some matchups. Jetpack, not really a place for the deck or not really a card for this deck, at least in my opinion. 
the cartel spacers can really put you in a position where you have a lot of extra space pressure or just a little bit of extra tempo play and i'm not a huge fan of playing Cobb vanth when i have things like boba fett available to me or seventh fleet defender or super laser technician etc in terms of sideboard really like the sideboard here um, we have the one no good to be dead the full of three waylays if you want some extra tempo advantage two lurking Typhanos against those soft control hard control matchups palpatine's return really good against discard decks helping you kind of discard these expensive cards draw palpatine's return and then just play it a turn earlier which can be really nice or just any deck that's attacking your hand or going to be a lot more grindy so you can return these malls and darth vaders and choose side so i've been going a little bit higher on this card um as of late Two signs. This is a card that swaps essentially a non-leader unit for an enemy non-leader unit. This is really good with Darth Vader's. It's really good with Bazine Natal's. It's really good with Salacious Crumbs in your deck. The idea behind this is you go turn six Darth Vader, uh, or maybe even earlier because you have resupplies and two blazer technicians. You grab like a Salacious Crumb and a Bazine Natal. Next turn, you choose signs. You take whatever they got uh, on the board, their best units, and you give them a one three. That could be pretty oppressive, and that's when choose sides is really excellent. So I do like it as a sideboard option, but it really only works as a sideboard option against those really high value decks. New Han Blue is a deck that choose sides is really good against, um, as you could steal things like Luke's or Redemption or Chewbacca or Crate Dragon or whatever it is. So pretty impressive there. But that's going to wrap up kind of our top eight breakdown and the overall breakdown of this uh, European Open. It was really exciting to see, and I love that Boss Blue took down the whole tournament. But let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Uh, definitely some classics here. And of course, we're always going to have the Boba Yellows and the Sabine Greens, at least for the foreseeable future until set three comes. We're still going to have, you know, the new Hans, uh, as that's been a pretty big staple of set two, whether it's Han Blue or Han Green or Han Red. But definitely exciting to see three kind of unique decks in the top eight. Yes, we've seen Palp Yellow. Yes, we've seen Cad Red. Yes, we've seen Bosk Blue. But we really haven't seen them all that much. And in Bosk Blue's case, we haven't seen it in the top eight. So that's exciting. Thanks for watching, everyone. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And I will see you all for the next one.